different from the other content that I usually post, which involves cars, but I thought that I would take the time right now to try and expand my portfolio and also try and inspire other future engineers that are maybe going through school, maybe in high school, maybe are trying to find a new career. I want to do my part in explaining exactly how things unfolded for me, how I got this position, how the position went, and how it helped gear basically my entire career to the engineer that I am now. I'm gonna have a new series. This is gonna be about my experiences, my different internships, maybe different projects, different classes. Just something to stimulate the mind of other engineering students, engineers, maybe even recruiters. Oh, okay, I see what you did there. Just so they can get a better idea exactly what it's like to actually work in an engineering laboratory. And moreover, what it takes to basically do it. And I'm gonna be totally honest, it doesn't take much. I'm a living proof of example. A lot of people like to say it, that this was God given, you were meant to do this. In reality, uh, I, don't, I don't think so. It just came down to one thing and one thing only, I wanted it bad. If you look at all my actions throughout my engineering academic career, uh, it's simply just ambition, pure ambition. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this program, how I got started with it. It was back in 2014. I had just finished doing a little bit of leadership within the community college. I was involved in a lot of programs and one specific program that really spoke to me was, uh, believe it or not, it was UCLA's CCCP. So this is a program primarily geared towards community college students. And I had already been a part of something like this with NASA at JPL. They had something called the NCAS program, and I'm actually gonna do a video on that and my experience there. So the NCAS program, kind of similar to this program, except the UCLA CCCP programs geared a variety of different majors, races, genders, you name it. So there was about 10 different programs that I was able to apply to. They range from either a one day academy to a week and the golden apple of all of it was a 10 week paid internship in a UCLA lab. It didn't matter what discipline you were, my discipline just happened to be mechanical engineering. And at the time I was very interested in biomedical devices, a little bit of aerospace, and I didn't really have a grasp on my automotive passion at this time. As a matter of fact, I hated changing my oil at this point, which is ridiculous. Look at me now. In 2014, I did not qualify for this program that I'm talking about. So in order for you to qualify, you had to have finished a certain amount of your major prep in community college geared towards your major to transfer to university. So if you're not familiar with the community college system, uh, you're able to transfer to a four year university uh, just by taking prerequisites of that major. So I needed to finish basically calculus, physics, chemistry, you name it. And funny enough, I like to think that things happen for a reason. I barely made the cutoff. Like I'm talking spring, I would have finished the requirement. Not even, this is like a couple of weeks before the program's supposed to start. So I barely made the cutoff. So this was me planning it basically a year in advance back in the summer of 2014 uh, to make sure I'm ready and I was qualified for this program. This program it was the UCLA, this is gonna be a word buster, UCLA CCCP TSSRP. Uh, so this was gonna be geared towards the application for the year of 2015 being that summer. Uh, it wasn't until December of 2014, which was probably four months after I decided to, you know, actively start to try and apply to these programs. And this was a research program. I had already known that undergraduate engineering students, uh, the biggest thing that would get them internships and jobs were if you were to do research. So me being at a community college, I was dead out of luck with opportunities because there wasn't enough funding within the community college system to actually get me to do research. So I had to look for programs that were geared for my unique situation and basically go after it and apply and hopefully get in. So I actually remember how many places I applied to. I applied to a USC internship, I applied to a UCLA internship, and I applied to a Berkeley internship. So I apply, I go through the whole application process, which is to write an essay, how to get letters of recommendation, how to submit transcripts. I got invited for an interview, it was a phone interview, and after that, I had my decision. So I got denied from USC's, that was the first rejection, and then I got rejected from Berkeley's as well. I actually went 
up to Berkeley, found the hiring manager or the person involved with the program and told her I need a reason why I wasn't accepted because I thought I was a viable candidate. Wasn't until probably a week after that, I got the email saying that I was accepted to the program. I was ecstatic. This was my first internship. I felt like it was my first break and just things started getting surreal. It went on for my onboarding with my parents. They talked about room and board. I was basically living in the dorms, eating at the commons and getting paid to do research and improve my engineering skills. So this was a plus for plus here. So the first day was cool because there was about 15 other students also from community colleges that got accepted into the program and they got divided up into their respective disciplines. So my roommate was a computer science major. He was from Elko College and he was an awesome guy. I loved to game, really, really smart. All these guys and girls here were very, very smart and like 80% of them went to a UC and if the other ones didn't, it was because it was a private or a very well-known institution. Got to the lab and got introduced to my other lab partners. Met with all the other people involved with the project. So this lab had about six other people there and it was primarily a mechatronics and control laboratory. So people were, you know, different backgrounds. One guy was from Berkeley. He was getting his master's there at UCLA. Another guy went to USC for his undergrad and now he's at uh, UCLA doing his PhD. Some people were international, working on crazy stuff. I had a guy working on one of the very first uh, cement 3D printers. Right now they're like everywhere, but he was the one that was developing one of the very first nozzles. Uh, Cause I mean, I have a 3D printer and a lot of the material gets stuck on the actual nozzle. So I, I understood it basically. Uh, some other guys work with like magnetic braking. Like it was, it was crazy, but it was very interesting to me. And it really pushed me to another level because I was working under the mechanical and aerospace department chair, which is a like world renowned guy. He's the department chair at UCLA. Uh, we call him TC, but is a uh, Dr. Tu Sing Chan. And he, he had like over 80 publications. I mean, he's been, you know, killing it. So my main project, the overview basically, to put it as simple as I can, was to design, model, and control a hydrostatic actuator for an MRI. So I'm actually gonna go into the engineering right now and talk a little bit about the program and exactly what was needed from me at the time. Primarily, the way biopsies are performed by doctors is uh, they have a syringe and they have you inside the MRI. The MRI does its job and now locates any malicious tumor, any malicious tissue, whatever it is. They go get a pen, mark the area of where it was located on the MRI, and then they start taking samples. They get a syringe, and they take upwards of 50 or up to like 100 samples. The reason being is because sometimes, most of the time, they don't get any malicious tissue because it's very hard to locate it once he's out of the MRI machine. And you might be thinking, okay, like let's just put some type of machine in an MRI that could cross interface and do it accurately. Well, that's basically what we wanted to do. We wanted something to be inside the MRI bore with the patient. So as it was running, it could update coordinates in the XYZ plane and locate the tumor or whatever malicious medium that you had and take accurate biopsy. Have a syringe puncture the person in the right spot with the right amount of pressure, right depth, right everything to extract that sample. So this would save the patient a lot of pain that they would have to endure. But the big issue here is that MRIs are a huge magnet and it's just spinning around you and it amplifies the resolution of any internal parts that are inside you. It's the best way to look at organs, look at muscles, whereas an x-ray typically is only able to detect a little bit more denser objects like bones. So MRIs are used in a lot of different applications and this would help that discussion in having autonomous robots or autonomous machines, systems, whatever you want, work with doctors and surgeons. So this was the problem that we had. This was a thesis that a previous grad student submitted for the program. Our job, our team's job was to add on to what he left from his thesis. And his thesis had a couple loopholes in it, nothing that was too crazy, but there were parts that needed to be improved. The three main parts was it wasn't autonomous, so it was not controlled to any motors, nothing to really have an accurate reading of where the syringe is within space. So one job for us was to automate it, basically have it controlled, whatever you know we decided. Another issue was to eliminate some jerking motion that it would have 
uh, because the actuators that we were using, which were basically syringes, had a medium mechanical impedance, meaning it took a lot of force to move it and the tolerance that it had in relation to the force applied wasn't ideal for surgeons. So you would have to push it a great amount of force from one side and it would result in a pretty drastic movement within the slave, which is a robot. So the master being the control system, which was the syringes, and the slave being the actual robot when it's being controlled. So the idea was to have the control system outside with the motors and everything and having liquid, which was a mixture of water and alcohol. Uh, we did that because with water, as you would push it, it would give some resistance and it would still let the water expand. So with having something, for lack of a better term, the viscosity was higher, so it was stickier, where molecules were sticking together easier. Uh, the force being translated using that alcohol mixture was more accurate as we extended the, the tubing and also added more liquid uh, and different forces. So we had three axes to work with. We had an X, we had a Y, and we had a Z. The Z was controlled with a separate syringe and that was just to extract the actual sample. But we had two of the syringes to control the X axis and the Y axis. After we updated the CAD file, we had to change the material to Delrin. And Delrin has a lower coefficient of friction and it's also able to be water jet cutted or also 3D printed. My main responsibility was to update the control systems being the master system within the hydrostatic actuator. So I had a couple ideas, a couple things that went right, a couple things that went wrong. Luckily then I had the opportunity, I had the time to actually learn SOLIDWORKS on my own. Uh, up until that point I only knew AutoCAD and that was from taking a class in high school as a sophomore. So this was four years after that and previously I only had experience using Google SketchUp and that was a free software that's what I use for uh, my program at NASA so I actually learned SOLIDWORKS an entire weekend because I really wanted to impress the department chair so by learning it I was able to play around with things you know I had to put in extra hours but it was necessary for me to get the product that I wanted I uh, went through a couple mechanisms uh, went through this design I uh, went through another design I ultimately ended up using something called the Whitworth mechanism. So Whitworth mechanism, I had to just literally look up different mechanisms to use. And after I designed my own and 3D printed it and prototyped it, uh, it was working perfectly. It was the control system that we wanted and it was able to be controlled using a rotary motor. And that was attached to a, a gear, I believe it was 16 tooth gear that would be attached to the motor and the timing chain would attach to like 128 tooth gear that was attached to the actual control system. So basically what I was able to do is by implementing an encoder, I would be able to, in theory, translate whatever rotational distance into linear motion. So that was exactly the case. By doing the whole gear reduction, it ended up being where I only had to turn the motor a couple steps to actually get a certain distance. We got enough torque. So like I said before, the issue was the syringes had a high mechanical impedance, meaning that you had to push it really, really hard. So here, since we had the torque, from the electric motor, we were able to move it as much as we needed using LabVIEW. And that's where my other partner came in to, you know, help me with that. So he was the one that actually programmed the motor using a MyRio microcontroller. And with that, we were able to use some LabVIEW, also something that we had to learn on the fly, and we used it to control it. So we were able to do simple movements, you know, move it here, move it there, but it was autonomous. And with the, all the other updates that we did, like uh, we also updated the pivot arm. So, so there was a lot of play within the pivot arm just because of the way it was manufactured and the way it was designed. So by updating that and by reducing the coefficient of friction by switching to Delrin, so polyoxymethylene, in addition to the Whitworth mechanism, ended up creating a pretty good product. And for the 10 weeks that we had, it was way more than we hoped to. Going into the project, all they wanted us to do or all that my advisor wanted us to do was to create a CAD. We didn't want to do that. We're, like I said, we're very, very ambitious. So we took it a step further and we actually started manufacturing and uh, prototyping it and putting a whole system together because in my mind, we decided you know, to put in the extra work to get this product to this level. So the design process was pretty simple. The first two weeks was basically just researching. We had to look through a bunch of previous papers, a lot of previous uh, other dissertations uh, on MRI compatible robots. We had to learn about 
MRIs. We had to learn about uh, what non-ferrous metals are. I was able to, like I said, have the opportunity to learn SOLIDWORKS and do some additive manufacturing. So we were able to use the 3D printers there and that's how I was able to rapidly prototype a lot of my parts. I learned about density, I learned about infill, I learned about a lot of different things, structural components, structural base, a lot of stuff. And that's kind of what inspired me to buy my own 3D printer because I had that experience. I knew you know, what STL files were, what G-code was, uh, all because of this program. So like I said, it was 10 weeks, you know, in addition to that, there was a lot of other fun things that we did. We hung out basically every single day within the dorm. It was the summer, so it was a lot less crowded. We were able to go to the gym. We were able to, you know, go and do stuff around there. My roommate and I would always, they call the dorms a hill. So the hill is basically on a hill and it's all downhill. And there's this main street that we would take our longboards uh, and skate down, literally not pedaling once, all the way down, and we calculated it to where if we started at a certain point, we would end up at Fat Sal's. And if you don't know Fat Sal's, Fat Sal's is the best place to get sandwiches. It is the best munchy food. Just food in general gives you heartburn like crazy, but that's basically what we were able to do there. The program was awesome. Like I said, lost a little bit of weight, uh, was able to learn a lot, met my girlfriend that we've been together for four years now. So a lot of good things happened from that. And it also set up the rest of my summers for the next three years, four years almost. I started off having no opportunity, getting rejected from all these different places and ended up interning for uh, the UCLA Mechatronics and Controls Laboratory under a department chair that is well-renowned within the engineering community as a community college student keep in mind so that means i had just taken calculus uh, i was just taking my you know second physics course barely finished coding like it was very very early on in my engineering career but that didn't stop me like i just wanted to learn so much and i continue to put that passion to every single project especially now with cars even if i don't know something I'm gonna take the right actions in order to learn that thing. I'm one, I'm resilient. I do not quit when it comes to something. You can see on my brake upgrade, I was missing parts, I broke parts. You know, I had a lot of things that I had to finish within a weekend and I was able to do it. And yes, I had setbacks, the same way I had setbacks at this internship, but honestly, those setbacks just make you better. I was watching a Joe Rogan podcast and he said, victories aren't as sweet unless you have the bitter. So what that means is if I didn't go through all the failures, if I didn't go through all the wrong approaches for design to control, whatever it is, if that wouldn't have happened, I wouldn't have learned and it wouldn't have made the experience that much better. The reason that I felt so touched by the program and I learned so much wasn't primarily just because something was given to me. The opportunity was given to me, but I made it my goal to make something out of it. And not a lot of people are willing to do that or not willing to fail. So something that I would encourage you guys to do, and I'm gonna leave you guys with this, is failure is a part of success. And it sounds counterintuitive, it does not sound like it makes sense, but I am who I am because of how much I fail. And I'm gonna fail again and again and again, but I'm gonna get up again and again and again. It's a constant battle, it's a tug of war between you and your mind you and your career, and you and your goal. If you have any questions, if you wanna see uh, more, I can put a link later for you to see it, maybe even share it, make it public on my Google Drive. I don't think I'll get in trouble for proprietary reasons. I really do hope that some of you guys get inspired from this or you know, have a better idea of what it is like to work at a UCLA lab. Like what, what more do you want? I, I was able to learn engineering, uh, work on my skills, uh, live on campus. So as a community college student, you kind of get robbed of that experience. You don't get to be a true freshman. You don't get to be on campus. I was able to get that experience. I, I got paid for it. I made friends. I made an amazing relationship. I still keep in touch with a lot of the people that I dormed with uh, that were on my floor. And it just makes me happy to see that we all started in the same spot, but we all ended up being successful in our own little way. And that's kind of what you want to surround yourself with. You want to surround yourself with those type of people. And if you don't have anybody, let me be that person. Like I said, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys got a little bit more of an insight of how I got an internship at UCLA's Mechatronics Controls Laboratory. And I hope that it can help you in your future get a similar or even better internship than I did. Uh, I think it's well worthwhile, even if it's not engineering, if it's something else, just go out and do it. I actually had to quit football to go to this internship. So I was a starting linebacker at, you know, at my community college uh, and I had to stop playing football. I had to make a decision between football or the internship and 
Well, I think I made the right decision. So if you guys like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment if you guys want to see uh, the other internships that I've done or, or maybe even reviews about the classes that I took as far as, you know, what I learned in controls, what I learned in my design class, what I learned in materials, what I learned in, you know, FSAE. There's a lot of things that I want to talk about, but it's only if you guys really want it. But like always, I'm going to leave you with this, which is my catchphrase if you don't know yet. And it's kind of a mantra that I set for myself which is to always give it your all, always go 100%, always have that momentum going the same way a turbo. When a turbo spools up, it keeps spooling up even after you turn off the car, it keeps spooling up. Never stop, never stop grinding, never stop working towards your goals, and like always, stay boosted.